you are burdening children with things that are totally developmentally inappropriate. And, and it almost, to me, it's like you're almost like chipping away at their childhood. The two of you are going back and forth and it's kind of like, well, it has th you know these characteristics, but there is nuance and it's complex. And then we have to remind ourselves we're talking about eight-year-olds. This is Just Asking Questions, a show for inquiring minds on reason. What are the schools really teaching our kids? Just Asking Questions. I'm Zach Weissmuller, senior producer for Reason, joined by my colleague, Reason Associate Editor Liz Wolf, author of the Daily Reason Roundup. Hey there, Liz. Hey, Zach. It is back to school season, which means the curriculum wars are back on the agenda. The right has accused activist infiltrators of indoctrinating the next generation with woke struggle sessions, confusing kids about their gender and sexuality, and turning K-12 through campuses into war zones by replacing discipline with pseudoscientific therapy. The left has accused the right of authoritarian book bans, whitewashing history, and discriminating against LGBT students and teachers. What's actually happening on campus? Joining us to talk about it today is Erica Sanzi. She's the Director of Outreach for Parents Defending Education, a nonprofit with a stated mission of fighting indoctrination in schools and promoting the restoration of a healthy, non-political education for our kids. She's all, she also serves on the board of the Boys Initiative and is a mother of three teenage sons. Erica, thank you for coming on the show. Thanks so much for inviting me, guys. So your organization falls clearly on the side of believing that schools are in danger of becoming full-on indoctrination centers. In fact, your website features an indoctrination map. Um, nation is capitalized, so, so we're in indoctrination. Uh, and you list examples from around the country, which we'll get into, but let's start with a little defining terms up here. What is the difference between indoctrination and education? Indoctrination is really the presentation of ideas in a way that either states explicitly or, or implicitly that these ideas are true, that there isn't really any debate, um, and that they're not to be questioned. And so as we've seen schools become much more dogmatic, particularly around a lot of the issues that I'm sure are going to come up in this conversation, uh, where rather than presenting students with the most compelling arguments on two sides of an issue and allowing them to discuss them, debate them, and then, you know, land where they land. And usually you'll see, you know, some kids will land on one side and some on the other. We see that missing a lot now. And instead it is you know, you are told um, that something is true, whether it's about race or gender or whatever. Um, and it's not only that you're discouraged from questioning it, but sometimes you're told that to question it makes you a bigot and is hateful. Yep. Is there, what's the way that people coming from the opposite perspective, perhaps people from the left, what would they what fault would they find in your organization's definition with indoctrination? Well, I think that what happens is when a person believes that they are on the right side of history or they believe that the policy or the lesson or the um, assertion falls under the umbrella of kindness hmm. or inclusion, um, hmm. That seems to be sort of where the rub is, right? So if you feel that your position makes you kind or and inclusive, and then you and then you think that anyone who doesn't agree with it is the opposite of kind and inclusive, um, it kind of means that there's a demonization of the person who doesn't agree with you, um, even though these are topics that are obviously very debatable. And certainly debatable in the context of a school, you know, funded with public dollars. Explain the an... geographic breakdown here based off of that map. Like, where is this happening the most? How screwed am I as a New York City resident ah. and mother? Ah, yeah. So New York City's, I mean, it's definitely one of the worst places in terms of this. Um, a what lot I, of red dots up there. Yeah. What <laughs> I always say 
well, the Northeast in general, right? Um, yeah. What I always say to people is that this is not universal, but it is pervasive. Yeah. And that means that, you know, if you live, like I live in a blue state, I live in Rhode Island, and we are a solid blue state. It does not mean that all of this sort of, again, dogma, orthodoxy, um, gender ideology, critical theory, it doesn't mean that it's showing up in every single school in the state. So, cause that would make it, you know, universal, but it is pervasive and it really does vary district to district because again, districts are governed largely by their local school board. Um, but what I would say is, um, I just lost my train of thought cause something popped into the chat. Hold on a second here. Um, but what I would say is that many of these issues or many of these um, policies are coming top down. So, for example, oftentimes you'll see the same, what I would call pretty extreme gender policy. You'll see that almost statewide because a lot of the guidance, which is technically non-binding, but everyone feels like it's binding because of the threat of losing money. So the guidance comes down from the state board of ed or from the or from the state school board association everybody just copies and pastes the policy and puts it in place so in some ways it's very locally driven but in other cases it's actually coming top down um and i think that's another important thing for people to understand especially when they're trying to figure out who they're mad at um <laughs> that really does kind of vary based on what the policy is or what the issue is that we're talking about but I want, I want to take us in a second into a specific example of what you would call indoctrination in New York City public schools. But first, just want to linger a little bit more on the indoctrination question, because, um, you know, it it sort of raises the question, the very basic question of what are schools for? What is the purpose of a school? And one obvious answer is to teach kids basic skills that they will need for life and a career like math and reading. <laughs> Another is that they need to develop critical thinking skills. And another still, I think, is that schools do inculcate values that seems like they always have done that. And civic virtue, as... unity. Right. The, and no. and especially when it comes to Exactly. I mean, especially when you start getting into those civics classes yep. or government classes or history tells a certain version of history. It's just the nature of how history works. And so is inculcating values in itself a problem? Is it something that's different? Uh, what exactly has changed in recent years from your vantage point? Well, in many ways, I feel like when schools relied on the golden rule, that kind of worked, right? That we teach okay. people, we, that we treat people the way that we want to be treated, that we treat people with kindness. Because a lot of the stuff around sexual orientation and gender and race and, and anti-bullying and social emotional and all this stuff, like it does really boil down to that you should be treating people with kindness and respect. Mm -hmm. But again, the definitions have gotten sort of distorted, I think, right? So it suddenly be, be, becomes a thing where if you don't agree with, I mean, I guess I maybe we could talk about specific examples, but generally speaking, it's sure. like if you don't agree with a person's worldview, that that your it's not just that your opinion is they they think it's wrong, it's like they don't it's not welcome. They don't even necessarily think you should be allowed to say it. And I'm not talking about slurs here. You know, Better. I'm talking about a kid in the hallway at his school who happens to say he doesn't uh, he doesn't agree with gay marriage. Mm. And, well, you know, yeah. forever, that was like something that people could have a conversation about. I mean, you would see even like friends could debate that subject. And now, like, that's the kind of thing that'll get you, um, you know, you'll be in trouble. You'll be sent down to the office that you're not allowed to say that in the hallway at school because that's hate speech. Mm. So in some sense, there's a free speech issue at play here. Oh, and I 100%. know, yeah, I know that some of your lawsuits that that your organization is party to is about speech and we can talk about those. But yeah, I think you're right to have us start digging into some specific examples. Uh, the one that I had pulled from your site. It's just one of the recent examples is out of New York City Public Schools. 
Um, it's a case study uh, of what you characterize as indoctrination. It, it would fall under what we call ethnic studies, formerly called critical race theory, and I perhaps rebranded. And uh, so, yeah, let me go back to this other slide. This shows New York City Public Schools introduces mandatory black studies curriculum for pre-K through 12th grades exploring oppression and activism. So it sounds kind of like a, a history class with a particular focus on the experience of black Americans. Um, but when we can dig Wait, into the on, curriculum. Go back to, on, go back to that yeah. last slide, Zach. Sure. I just want to highlight this, especially for our audio listeners. The curriculum starts, and I'm quoting here from the New York City Public Schools um, statement, the curriculum starts as young as pre-K with lessons focusing on identity. One pre-K lesson warns teachers that they should be aware that European beauty standards are considered ideal in the United States, such as light slash pale skin color, straight hair, blonde or other colored hair, etc., and should reject that narrative when teaching. The next lesson, which focuses on water in Burkina Faso, asks teachers to dispel the misconception that we should have pity for people who live in Burkina Faso because all African countries obtain water in this way. It is believed that in America, all water is clean and safe when in fact many families filter their water at home to remove impur impurities when city or town filtration systems are not strong or reliable. I'm sorry, but like the European beauty standards thing for pre-K students, like this just kind of simply isn't something, I mean, my son is two right now, maybe this will change over the next year or two, but an emphasis on beauty standards and what is or is not sort of seen as normal and routine and baked in. Like, I just kind of don't want teachers focusing on that at all. It just seems, um, I think, irrelevant and or like something we can just discuss at home. Like, why well, not, if I'm going to be sending my son to another school, like, why not have the teacher be specializing in things that I'm less adept at teaching versus things that are a little bit more judgment calls or subjective or, I mean, he's also a or a, developmentally inappropriate for the little, age. I mean, a little what? white and blonde dude. And so it's like, okay, well, I don't know whether his mind at three or four is really going to be at the level of being able to intelligently process that type of thing. And also, I just kind of like, I don't know, he still thinks about he's obsessed with cats right now, right? Like, I don't even know if I want to get into European beauty standards anytime soon. <laughs> Is well, that crazy? I, like, is that? No. I'm just thinking about this because are you New York crazy? City? No, well, that no. New York City public schools pre-K. I'm sorry, but like, I can literally send him to these programs starting a year from now, and I'm just thinking like he wants to talk about cats and bunny rabbits and or like cars and trains. He doesn't want to talk about European beauty standards and whether or not he as a blonde person is um in in any way an oppressor. He's an oppressor. Yeah. He's walking, okay. I mean, I hate to say, but there's a good chance he's going to hear the you know come to believe that he's done something wrong by looking like that. And so there's a few things going on here. One thing is that what we often see in some of these, this content is just the age, the ages are way off. Yeah. So could a high school class talk about like beauty standards? Yeah, I think they certainly could talk about that. That you seems can have, You could have robust conversations about that subject. But a pre-K, I mean, that's like age four. And... And, again, York, and, and, and I, and we're I, talking three-year-olds and four-year-olds. Yes. Like, and I also, you know, I just think that the people who write these don't have kids or don't have experience with children because, I mean, the truth is most guys at any age aren't really going to be that jazzed about talking about European beauty standards, and that's no. not a bad thing. Yeah, so, well, the other I mean, thing, yeah, I mean, just to look at the actual lesson plan here for the pre-Ks, it's the you know Liz mentioned the Burkina Faso water the, quality the... is the <laughs> lesson plan learning about that is the lesson plan for the three and four year olds and it's essentially <laughs> you know they are then going to make a homemade water filter using like a coffee filter and co cotton balls and gravel and stuff I... like that it does sound fun but uh, at, the, at the end of the day when my four year old's coming home from pre-k all she's going to remember is pouring water through something and like some very vague things about filtration, which is good. I, I'm not sure she's going to absorb the uh, socio-political lessons at that point. But I guess your point is that they're, you know, this is sort of getting them on a track at a very early age to start thinking in a certain way. Yeah, I mean, okay, there's a few things. Number one, we constantly hear about how children are arriving to school totally unprepared. You know, they don't know their numbers. They don't know their letters, et cetera. And yet, when you think about that lesson, like that lesson is kind of an idea. Those are ideological lessons. 
So the first question is like, what are the fundamentals and the basics that the kids need to know in order to be successful and to become the best versions of themselves? And is the answer to, the, to that question found in this lesson? And I would argue that it's not. Right. Now, because there's a precious trade off because you have limited time. Correct. And so you're going to have to decide are you going to focus on this or are you going to focus on, I don't know, developing motor skills or something like that? And, and also, I mean, young children are very sensitive too. So, like, you're going to have some students that are going to feel really sad that some people don't have clean water to drink. And again, that's not a bad thing. I think empathy is really, really important. But mm -hmm. again, like, is a, is a parent going to be like, why is my daughter or son, you know, so upset about water in some faraway place right now because of a lesson in school? So I think there's two things going on. I think one is the ideology driving it, but I think the other thing is the age appropriateness. And a major thing that we see, and, and by the way, I'm glad that you're showing, like, what, what our organization does do is we, we, People send us things or give us tips or whatever, but we always look at the lessons and we always provide the primary sources and we do not editorialize at all in our write-ups. It's basically yeah. like, here's where, here's what it is. You can look at it for yourself. You can love it. You can hate it. You can have mixed feelings. So um, that's a very important part of my of our organization that as, as there's people are sort of yelling and screaming about lots of things out there right now that, that actually misinform because... They're not what happened, right? So you might hear they can't read about Ruby Bridges. They can't read about Anne Frank. They get you know all of these sort of myths that have been you know flying around now for a few years. And mm -hmm. so what we try to do is to say no. These are the primary sources, whether it's the policy, whether it's the lessons, whether it's the minutes from a board meeting, and then readers can decide what they think. Would you go back to that slide for a moment, Zach? The pre-K slide, because we've yeah. also got second through uh, 12th yeah. grade yeah, to go through I, here, but let's just, linger on pre-K for another second. I just yeah. wanted to note the very top of this where it talks about, and this is, again, the official New York City guidance here for pre-K. Teachers should understand that many African countries are contemporary and modern and should reject stereotypes that project that all African countries are wild or underdeveloped places. Um, I just, I, I, I like, it's odd to me, like, the differences between different African countries, I'm sorry, a lot of this is just not going to be on a three-year-old or four-year-old's radar. And there's also a certain amount of like, I can understand not wanting to erase or collapse differences between African countries, but also we don't need to be operating from a place of like bullshit peddling because like, I don't know, I've traveled through a whole bunch of sub-Saharan Africa. A lot of Africa is underdeveloped. We can be very specific as yeah. to which countries, but the fact of the matter is that many, many, many millions of people live in poverty on that continent. And so I can understand. Um, it's just a little bit odd to me, the sense of like, we need to be yeah, doing we'll look like, at the a campaign for African nations uh, and, and as if three and four year olds will suddenly become anti-racist as a result of yeah. trying to portray Africa as like a modern and developed place across the board. Like, I'm sorry, like to me, this just seems a little bit like somebody has somebody who's writing curriculum has a bee in their bonnet about this and they see this as a, a, an appropriate manifestation of some of their anti-racist mission. But it means that, A, we might legitimately be kind of misleading three and four-year-olds and B, it's just kind of already not really on their radars and I'm not sure whether they'll be able to understand these distinctions here. In fact, they may be surprised later in life to learn that in places like Democratic Republic of Congo, it is actually, in fact, a very backwards uh, place that does not have a lot of modern conveniences and is very underdeveloped. And we should be free and not portrayed as racist to be able to just say that because it's just a basic fact. Can't say that when in we... New York City Public Schools, sorry. Yeah, I guess not. But it's just, it just strikes me as like odd. Like I've traveled through that country. Like it was, it was, it's okay. obviously okay. not with modern conveniences how you would have to be deluded to think it is. Well, Liz, it says that the misconception is that we should have pity for people who live in Burkina Faso because all African countries obtain water in this way. It is believed that in America, all water is clean and safe when, in fact, many families many. filter their many. water at home to remove impurities. I would um, love to see the data so, on that. Like how many right. we have 330 million people living in this country. How many million are removing impurities via water filtration and actually don't have access via their faucets to clean water? Like, I'm sorry, but like. Also, it's like, what? why are you talking to preschoolers about this? Like, to me, uh, this is like the kind of thing that, like, I'm actually learning something. Like, it's like, this is not, I, it, I always try to remind people, we're talking about children who hide their teeth under their pillow because they believe in the tooth fairy. 
They sit on Santa's lap. They believe that Santa Claus comes down. You know, these are they believe that unicorns are real. These are children, and part of being a child is that magic, right? Of the imagination and of believing things. And so, as as we're talking about this lesson, it's almost like why are you burdening young children? with these topics and that's a big thing that i often see this as is it's like you are burdening children with things that are totally developmentally inappropriate and and it almost to me it's like you're almost like chipping away at their childhood by by getting them to think about and worry about and grapple with things that are just way beyond you know their sort of abilities and i'm not this person who thinks you know kids can't learn anything and don't know anything of course they can but this just seems again. I mean, it's like madness, um, and and this is a bit of an extreme case. Like we do see this in other places as well. I don't want any viewers to think that like this is a normal lesson for pre K across the United States. It's not. But what, am I shocked to see it? No, because we do see this kind of thing increasingly, especially in really progressive blue cities. Yeah, I mean, New York City, New York public school system has got to be one of, if not the, the largest. largest school system. So, I mean, it has impact in that way, even if it's isolated. And this, uh, I mean, let's move forward to second grade and see what uh, the plan is for second graders. The second grade curriculum begins introducing colonization and activism to students. It recommends the book, The ABCs of the Black Panther Party. One lesson aims for students to know about the indig- how the indigenous people of New York were stewards of this land before it was colonized. A later lesson in the unit focuses on social issues and activism and plans and activity requiring kids to pick a social issue and steps they can take to solve it, like writing a letter to a community board member. Um, what is your take on this kind of assignment for second graders? Um, I mean... Overall, you know, learning about the local history and indigenous people does not seem like a, a terrible lesson plan. Uh, the ABCs of the Black Panther Party is a little uh, odd because the A is for Black- Asada Shakur who killed a cop, right? Like, <laughs> can you imagine? Can you like? Well, can you imagine? Yeah, I mean, look, the- read this to a seven-year-old. Well, it's like you know the so the Black Panther Party was at odds with. MLK because it emphasized more of a kind of racial consciousness instead of the MLK colorblindness ideal. Yeah. It also was an explicitly Marxist and anti-capitalist movement, which we'll and see more of. Violent, a violent radical movement, right? Like they, it, there was violence. I mean, it had there, there were lots of uh, honestly there were there were lots of good things about the black. Panther Party. It was a lot about self-reliance and self-defense and community. So I'm, I'm not saying it's all bad, but it, it's a, to me, it's a notable turn, especially in second grade, to be focusing on the Black Panther Party instead of somebody like Martin Luther King Jr. I mean, that's, again, obviously by design. And, and even to hear like the two of you are going back and forth and it's kind of like, well, it has th- you know these characteristics, but there is nuance and it's complex. And then we have to remind ourselves we're talking about eight-year-olds right so 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 i actually would say even though i think that this ideological bent is a problem in the schools i think i'm more appalled at just the 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 age inappropriateness of a lot of this um yeah. and then when you look at the literacy outcomes and the math outcomes in the new york city public schools that's when like your head explodes because, because all of this is coming at the expense uh, of yeah time spent actually learning how to read. So tell us about like what what's a snapshot of literacy in America for these younger age groups? Well, we know that two thirds of students in the United States are not proficient readers um, and the numbers are worse in math. And those were the figures before the pandemic. So this does vary place to place. So, for example, like where I am in Rhode Island, we have Providence is a really struggling school system. They are, last I looked, they have 13% of the students in Providence are proficient in reading, and the math number is under 10%. So we're looking at school districts that have, I mean, we know, I mean, Baltimore has a whole bunch of high schools where they have 0% proficiency. So when you're talking again about, but what's interesting is some of the people writing this curriculum, they don't even, they're against testing. You know, they don't want to focus on literacy. 
they see this focus on literacy and reading and proficiency as, you know, some sort of like white supremacist, who knows what. So it almost feels sometimes like it's by design that they're supplanting the basics and the fundamentals. Because remember, those basics and those fundamentals were kind of agreed upon. Like we've always sort of agreed that those matter. But if you're trying to tear down a system and sort of dismantle, right, well, the reading and math isn't as important as making sure that people start to believe, you know, some of this stuff. And it's like, you don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist. And the other thing is most rank and file teachers probably think this is nuts. I mean, that's the other thing that's really kind of complex about this. It's kind of like when we talk about the teachers unions and you have what the leaders do and believe, and then you have the rank and file and there's just a massive disconnect. Well, it's the same thing with the rank and file teachers often and with what's coming in with some of these like really extreme um you know, content and and curriculum decisions. So it's kind of hard to say, although I would also add that newer teachers are marinating in all of this um, sort of sort of extreme ideological. They're taught that teaching is a political act. They're taught that being a teacher is to be an activist. They're taught that their obligation is to create, you know, agents of social change. So if you talk to a teacher in their 40s versus one that just got out of school, their experience in their teacher preparation programs at these colleges of education is going to be really different. Um, and so, again, that's also it, it's coming in in part because the aspiring teachers really do marinate in this worldview and in this ideology um, in school and are kind of told, like, your obligation is to be a teacher who does this. Could I play devil's advocate for a moment? Sure. I I'm wondering about the flip side of this, right? Like we are uh, not to be extraordinarily woke, but I, I do think it's an important thing to consider. We're all saying basically, you know, public school curriculum had been largely satisfactory up until some of these ideas took hold. And we can peg that to maybe like a decade ago or so, though it seems like it's really spiked in the last five or so years. Um, is like this our, for lack of better term, white privilege talking where we perceived it to be satisfactory, but in fact, a lot of black families didn't feel that way. And now the greater representation in lesson plans is actually something that's leading to, um, I guess it's very hard to measure, but leading to, you know, younger black students feeling a little bit more like, wow, issues that might have been on my radar or components of my history are now being discussed with more depth. So it's not just Mark Martin Luther King Jr. Now it's MLK and Malcolm X and some Black Panther historical figures too. Like, is it possible that there's um, this undercurrent and in fact, people feel served by the public school system because these types of lessons have been incorporated to a far greater degree in the last five years than ever before? Uh, I would say that it kind of depends because, again, there's such variation in terms of like what the what the content is school district to school district. Also, it, like the other thing is racial minorities are not a monolith. And I feel like that's another thing well, that has, so, so I, I, I have two, added to what I'm saying. I have two initial thoughts. One but, but, is some people and I happen to be one of them, you know, went to schools where we read tons of texts written by black authors. So you're reading James Baldwin, you were reading um, Malcolm X, Invisible Man, uh, Black Boy. What was the other one that... Um, Daniel Hurston, Their Eyes Are Watching God was like my yeah, favorite. Thing that, I know why the cage bird's saying. So like yep. you had like, but I have talked to people my age and they're like, I didn't read any of those books. <laughs> so one thing is I do think that in some places there was an absolute dearth in terms of the variety and the perspectives and, and and what the content looked like, that it was really, there was just no diversity of any kind in there. That was a problem. Other places I think did a much better job. The difference is now what we see, and I spoke to this a little bit on the, the Honestly podcast about books, is like sort of rather than lo looking at these very rich pieces of literature written by black authors, you know, and even who didn't necessarily agree with each other on everything. So it gives you a lot to talk about and think about. Instead, what we're kind of seeing is this shift to these newer texts where just the writing quality is lousy. It's an and again, it's not I hate to say like well-placed profanity versus like gratuitous profanity. But I think that kind of is what it is. Um, the other thing I would say is what we see is that a lot of the minority families are not down with this ideology in school at all. So it sure. also, I think, bothers them just like it would any group. They're, they're a real mixed bag in terms of what they think is appropriate. 
certainly around the age appropriateness and even around like, you know, some might think it's great that they're studying the Black Panthers and Angela Davis and other parents would be like, are you kidding me? Like you haven't even talked to my kids yet about whatever Martin Luther King, let's say. And now you've got a giant posters of Angela Davis and Che Guevara on the wall. So I just I think it does like it it really does vary. And I think that you, what you're asking is important because mm. I think a lot of us would say that the traditional curriculum in a lot of places isn't good enough. But that's not the same as saying, so let's switch to this like totally extreme, hyper ideological um, view view where we also essentially tell you what you are allowed to say, what you're not allowed to say. I would also well, yeah, posit so that there's probably a non-zero number of black families or black parents out there who are pro the teaching of Angela Davis in the classroom, but maybe a little confused by the pronoun situation and children having to declare their pronouns in school. Um, and I think it's that that's like a, a side that I think gets frequently kind of erased by a lot of ultra progressive social justice types where it's like just because um, one group accepts one component of this doesn't mean the entire slate, the entire agenda is accepted wholesale. And I think when you find when you stop referring to minority groups as these sort of like monolithic forces, you actually realize that like there is a ton of depth and texture. And maybe there's a lot of families out there that are, you know, devoutly Christian, in fact. And would like those values to be inculcated in their children, but also want some amount of um, awareness of Black history. And like, it's not just one or the other. Exactly. And our polling, our polling shows that. Mm -hmm. So when we did polling on this, the numbers around, I mean, it did depend on how you ask the question. So like, if so like, let's just talk about sort of like the race essentialism or the critical race theory, the, the race stuff polled it was not nearly as like you, you it was not 50 50 but you could see that there was a lot of disagreement around the race stuff in the schools the gender stuff on the other hand the numbers were like why it was like 80 20 75 25 so the same parents that were much more comfortable with what was happening around race in the schools were very uncomfortable with what was happening on the gender front that tracks with yeah. like people i know in the wild <laughs> same yeah <laughs> and uh, and the the gender front is a big component of what you all are focused on, and we should turn to that in a second. I, I want to uh, I want to just close out this New York uh, public schools curriculum discussion though by zooming ahead to eleventh grade to kind of see where this all what this all how this all culminates because um, you're talking about shifting from certain texts to other texts and certain readings to other readings and how it's been rather radical and, and rapid. Um, so this kind of, I think the 11th grade curriculum sort of shows you where it's all headed when you start planting the seeds in pre-K. The 11th grade curriculum focuses on black disenfra disenfranchisement, policing, and reparations. It has students read a Vox article about reforming, defunding, and abolishing police before asking, why is ending policing and prisons a critical chapter in the Black freedom struggle? It spends three lessons focused on reparations, mostly using Ta-Nehisi Coates' essay, The Case for Reparations, suggested homework for the lesson, asks students to design a reparations program, or write a letter to their congressman. Students are also asked to describe how capitalism relies on debt peonage. So here we see that ex the anti-capitalism explicitly laid out um, and also s deep engagement with modern contemporary activism. And for me, that's not something that's completely inappropriate for a junior in high school to be studying or engaging with. But it is perhaps a little bit concerning when you've had them on a certain track towards this destination since pre-K. So I guess the, the big question I have, like pondering all this, is we want our students to be engaged politically and, you know, have some level of awareness and maybe even, you know, though for those who are inclined and interested in activism, what would be the actual healthy way that you think students should it be engaging with contemporary politics? Uh, is it clear from the lesson I can't see that the letter to the congressman would be can only be in favor of reparations? 
it, one of the things doesn't... that we'd run into is um, like students would be assigned something like you're going to write a letter to your congressperson to tell them that they need to get rid of Columbus Day and make it Indigenous Peoples Day. So that's obviously a problem because you're not, you know, you're putting aside, we can debate whether they should be writing to their congressperson or not in school, but telling them, you know, the position that they need well, to issue, right? Because what I would say on, on this, I think that so that this is actually kind of an easy one, too, because I believe the essay that the Ta-Nehisi Coates essay, I believe that was his testimony when he testified in front of Congress. And it seems to me that, OK, well, Coleman Hughes also testified on the other side. So you would yeah. just the kids would read both. They would read yeah. ta argument and they would read Coleman Hughes's argument. And then they would do, you know, something where you're kind of debate again, debating da da da. And then kids draw whatever conclusion they they draw. And again, I suspect that you would have some be on ta side and some would be on Coleman Hughes's side. So that this is what we often see is missing. And so whereas there's some people out there that sort of are like, no, don't talk about these subjects in school. What my organization and I am saying is like you need a free exchange of ideas. And that means no, no. that you need both of the most compelling arguments. Yep. So on the reparations thing, that would be an easy solution. Um, we see this also like we see lots of lessons where that say explicitly just say requiring voter ID is a racist. And I'm thinking, huh, that's that's indoctrination. I mean, that's really there's. But if you were to say people disagree about this topic, here are the arguments. And then right. people again. Th th so that's what's kind of missing. And, I, 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 and we see this a lot, like even the whole like they talk about America all the time, like it's a patriarchy as if like, wait a minute, like. So, when did we agree on that? Like, that's a cool debate for kids to have, too, right? Like, is America a patriarchy? And then again, there'd be plenty of robust content, pro and con. And then because I feel like what happens is they skip those initial steps and instead they just tell kids. This is the way it is and kind of like all good and smart people believe this. Hmm. There's also a component to this. I th Two things come to mind as we think about this. One, it goes back to the point we were just making, which is like, I know a lot of black families that do not want the abolition of the NYPD or of prisons. Um, they're frequently black families who live in really crime ridden neighborhoods. Um, sometimes you have issues with the way that the police serves you or your community or their response time or how staff they are or how individual officers act. But by and large, I think there are so many people, in fact, those most likely to be victimized by crime who look at that type of idea as one that can only be promoted by um, a Brown University grad or a Wellesley grad who has never been the victim of crime or lived in a neighborhood where they have to fear that. Uh, if your safety and the safety of your family is not secure, you literally cannot go about your life and build a good life. And I think that that connection is very apparent to people who actually live in really, truly poor and crime ridden places. So it's a very like stupid and privileged way of thinking about it that I think is detached from what a lot of these families actually want. And then the other thing that really comes to mind here is just how is this type of thing like, you know, there is an age appropriate way, I think, to have this type of discussion. But fundamentally, you know, these are not necessarily even things that should be the highest and most pressing priority for kids of this age. Like, I'm sorry, but like these are trendy um, issues that are being discussed uh, in the opinion pages of major publications and on Twitter right now, it doesn't mean they are necessarily academic theories with a lot of staying power. Like the cop and prison abolition had a really big moment, had its heyday um, post summer of George Floyd, post, you know, May 2020, that entire summer. This was a thing that was, you know, on people's radars. But it's not clear to me that in 2030, this will be a thing that has um, resonance and that is actually a big part of our political discourse. And so it's like, well, you know, I guess to some degree, curriculum is frequently responsive to trends in some form. And what teachers talk about and how they interpret things is predicated on trends. But to what degree are we just really, really leaning into the trends of politics in 2020, as opposed to thinking about things with real staying power that children actually should be grappling with? Well, part of the issue is that much of this content came in as a result of 2020. Mm -hmm. So okay. what we sort of saw was, uh, oh my God, we have to do something because everybody, every company, every nonprofit and every school district, we have to do something. And so what was that shiny thing on the shelf that they could grab really quickly to do something? And it was often, um, you know, a more sort of like extreme critical theory based, maybe it's a DEI consultant, maybe it's a DEI company. So 
those all those consultants um many of them they're kind of like largely all the same and that was the shiny thing on the shelf that they could quickly grab and pay for and say we did something um and i really do feel like in many ways like because they chose so poorly in that moment um it's really has been wreaking a lot of havoc and that's part of why you see this this parental rights movement which it's sort of like loosely called you know part of why you see this uprising of parents is because so much of what came into their schools is this extreme right so you're saying oh great now my kid's learning that like we need to abolish the police oh and he's also being told that he can pick his own gender or he can be a boy or a girl or both or neither um oh and by the way this is on the heels of them closing our schools and we have, you know, our, our, our reading proficiency rates are 20%. So it's just like this. I think that it, it's so easy to say that the parental rights thing, oh, that's like a right wing thing or it's right coded. But what I've noticed over this time is it, it, it's really not like what we see. And now the, the parents we see that are a little bit less inclined to speak publicly maybe are more sort of progressive and more on the left because they just have a lot more to lose in terms of their social network and in but but we see across the political spectrum you know concern and frustration from parents and again if you only live in the sound bites if you only watch msnbc or you only live in these sound bites then yeah you think it's a bunch of right-wing like racist parents who are just like evil bigots but as soon as you sort of dig down a little bit and look at the primary sources like we're doing today you see that like even if you didn't agree with the parents concerns it's easy to see why they have them i think that that's the i think it's like it would be really unfair to be dismissing the concerns and the criticisms once you really look at what's going on yeah you i live in florida which has taken a lot of national criticism for some of the law the education laws that the governor has implemented however to your point if you look at the public polling on the sort of reigning in the discussion of sexuality, for instance, in younger grades, across all party identifications, mm -hmm. it's popular. So I think there is, a, I hate to use the you know Nixonian silent majority term, but there kind of is one, I think, when it comes to some of this stuff for parents, um, Trusting their kids to these institutions, they want some constraints on them. You mentioned though um, consultants, and you have a consultant report card on your website, and you identify that uh, what over this this time period, which I believe was from like around 2019 to 2021. Yeah, this th this was kind of an early pro. So we're only three years old. Um, we launched yeah. in March of 2021, and this was like a pretty early project that, to be honest, we have not kept up with. Um, okay. But, but so you'd identified like 19.5 million uh, out, doled out to consultants. And then the top consultant here is Panorama Education, which is five, has received $5.2 million in contracts. My understanding is that's a Mark Zuckerberg uh, and, and his wife project. Um, what is going on here? Like, how do we get to the point where there are so many consultants making so much money. Um, I mean, I know our schools got billions in COVID money. Was some of that going to these consultants? What is the story? What is the consultant story as far as you've been able to tease it out so far? Yeah, I mean, it really depends. One way that these, like my state, for example, we have a statewide contract with Panorama Education. Okay. So the survey that is given out once a year to all students, and I believe there's two versions. I think one is like the elementary version and then the other one's like grades six through 12. Um, and so these these consultants make money um, by like, for example, so surveying kids has become a big thing that we've seen. And like that's an example of something where I as a parent never really thought about it. And then when I began looking at it cl more closely, I was like, hell no, my kids not. Um, we're not taking these. Um, and the reason is because these surveys that are given by Panorama and other companies um, are have become very intrusive in terms of the questions. The questions are. um Again, I would argue very age inappropriate. For example, like the 11 year olds answer a question about, have you ever create, made a suicide plan? Mm. What? 
Jeez. And that's, um, and then they'll say, how many sexual partners? And so what happens is- For how old? Ele- well, sixth grade, so 11, ele- 11 in the fall. You would yeah. help make like zero. I don't know. Is that and like cool? And the other thing that's- so, so one of the things that these surveys do, and I think a lot of new policies in schools do, is they make the outlier the default. So right. because there is a child who has struggled with suicidal thoughts, or there is a child that has is having- multiple sexual partners at the age of 11 and 12 that becomes the def- now everybody's going to have to know about it think about it talk about it answer questions about it mm-hmm. it's a little bit like with the um with the policies like even around a lot of the gender stuff too it's like mm-hmm. it's like because there may be a few kids that are either into this or struggling with this or whatever around their gender now it becomes the default that everybody needs to have pronouns state their pronouns agree to you know to never say certain things um and so that's one of the things i feel like they've sort of pathologized childhood so that because you have um like my son was doing a survey and it was asking why were you absent so he's looking for the multiple choice answer that says i had a doctor's appointment and that's not on there but what is on there is i was drunk or high um I couldn't get a ride to school. Someone's bullying me so badly. I don't want to go to school. I had to go with my parents to translate for them. Like there's all these. And it's so it's like, and again, like, yes, those situations do occur and they do happen. But like it becomes like the default. There wasn't even an answer that I had a doctor's appointment. Like It's like, and I'm like, yeah, well, so it's do you see what I mean. It's like you take these sort yeah. of like situations that are very real but not the norm, and you try to make it like the norm for everybody. Huh. Um, and so that's one way is the surveys. The social emotional learning thing, which is also a big scam, um, they all, everybody's contracting out with companies to provide, again, curriculum, surveys, um, these like data dashboards where they do these like mental health screeners. Now, is this yeah. all just, mental, so is this social emotional learning, like does this just mean like, taking care of your mental health well social emotional learning used to be sort of about like soft skills so oh. it was like cooperating sharing um maybe looking somebody in the eye maybe um trying to like use your time wisely but in 2020 um castle which is the the it's the big organization for social emotional learning i think it has the word collaborative in it they changed their definition in 2020 to be to this thing called transformative SEL. And that's all about the collective equity, social justice, et cetera. So right. again, what we see is people who know the old social emotional learning are kind of like, yeah, like sharing, cooperating, soft skills. Those are important. But people who know the new definition are like, no, like, again, this is another example sort of where that that feeling of that ideological capture kind of creeping into schools where suddenly an empathy lesson is explained to a girl why yeah. if she feels uncomfortable in the bathroom with like a male staff member or a male peer who identifies as a girl, like if she feels uncomfortable, like that's not OK because she needs to be have empathy for them. See what I'm saying? So it's become this yeah. like. And so it's like become a big political hot potato and um, and it's a very expensive thing yeah. for schools to get into. And they're spending a lot of money on that. Well, yeah, with the expense, you know, the schools got a lot of money from uh, the federal government after COVID, over a hundred billion dollars. And now that seems to have run out starting this school year. Correct. What is going to happen? Are, are these consultants and these sort of accessory programs, you know, the lowest hanging fruits, or is it just, we're going to like keep all of the consultants and double the class sizes or like, how do you see that shaking out? I mean, it's hard to say. And sometimes it's like a limited contract, you know, so maybe they they, they pay them for like two years. And so they're not, it's not like a, I mean, in some ways, I can't believe I'm saying this, but because the COVID money, they always knew it was going to run out, but a lot of districts made really bad decisions. And so they put the money into things that recur forever. So they gave yeah. raises, for example. 
So in terms of smart use of one-time funds, the consultant at least falls into that category because it's not like an in perpetuity expense, even though I would argue it's a very dumb expense that, that again, there's just no evidence at all to show that these programs like help or do really any good. Um, but in terms of the COVID money, a lot of places are in big trouble because they they just didn't use, I mean, in some ways it was hard for them. They had to use this money and it's like, how do we use it? And so if you gave bonuses, again, smarter because it's a one-time thing, but people that mm. hired, they hired a lot of staff or they gave raises, well, now they've got a problem because now they either have to let the staff go and they, you know, now the raises are forever. And what, and I think some school districts thought, okay, well, they're never, you know, they're going to feel bad for us. So they're just going to, they're not going to cut the money off. You know, <laughs> they're going to, they're going to make us whole, but that's not happening. Um, so a lot of districts are having to right size their budgets and it means some pretty, pretty painful cuts. But they, and, and the, the larger the district, if you're a large district or a higher poverty district, it looks like you're getting way more cuts, but that's just because they got so much more money mm. so that the, that the delta is bigger for them. Um, so, yeah, so there's a lot of recalibrating and right sizing going on and it's not going to be easy, but uh, but they it, it's not easy, but they knew like we knew when this yeah. money was turning off. And I think and it were... could be it could be an opportunity to refocus things in a positive direction, may, maybe. But uh, who, who knows how that will shake out? Yep. When I read about groups like yours, what I hear is that you want to ban books, your book banners. <laughs> and um, PEN America is a literary and free speech organization that tracks uh, what they call book bans around the country. I've pulled a, cut, a little bit of their data. Uh, they say of the th that 874 unique titles were banned between July 1st, 2022 and December 1st, 2022. And then they break it down here by category. The most common category is books that include themes or instances of violence and physical abuse. And then that's 44% had that as the reason for the ban. Then there's others that the, the next category is topics on health or well-being for students and then themes of grief and death. And then the, the second half here is 30% of the um, bans had to do with characters of color or themes of race and racism. 26% had to do with LGBTQ plus characters or themes, 24% sexual experience between characters, and the smallest category here is mention of teen pregnancy, abortion, or sexual assault. I would say it's those three categories in the middle, LGBT and characters of color, that get a lot of the attention. And the what the the impression you get is that conservatives just don't want books about race or gay or trans people in the school libraries. Is that true? No, that is not true. I mean, there are some people who probably feel that way, but yeah. that certainly is not the majority. Just out of curiosity, was that school libraries or was that like in was that across the board, which would include probably school and also like local public libraries? School book bans. Okay. Yeah. Was, um, yeah. Index of school book bans. Yes. So, so the first important thing to know is that PEN America, when they use the word banned, it, they're using it in a way that no other person, I think, in the history of the universe has ever used it. So PEN America calls any restriction on a book a ban. Mm -hmm. And that includes, and they are open about this, like they have said this publicly, that includes if you were to move a book from the elementary school library to the middle school library or to the middle school to the high school and they yeah. even include in their band definition um moving a book from the elementary shelf like if you had a school that was k-8 if a book had been in the on the shelves for the younger kids and instead got moved to the older kids section pen america mm. would also consider that a ban so, so you're saying they're trying to juice their numbers a little bit by <laughs> including these uh just kind of live this sort of library organization process in yeah no the they banner. definitely yeah. I, I mean Feng Shui I don't is a book ban now apparently Zach I mean not that it's really Feng Shui but like legitimately it's you know we I could imagine librarians could make different decisions about appropriateness like really this is 
librarians making judgment calls, which I would imagine yeah. they've done as curators for a really long time. The but, other th okay, but that's one aspect. I mean, again, I'll bring it back to my Florida experience. There was a whole process they went through where they were like, look, libraries, you're on notice. We've got a list of categories here that is not appropriate for the school to have uh, books about and um, the librarians had to go through and call a bunch of material is that uh, it on its on the surface level it that seems kind of authoritarian it was that yeah and also again like at the end of the day local communities kind of do need to figure out where they're going to land on this and I would not expect right. every school district to make the same decisions what yeah. I would say is that again there's been a lot of books written recently mm -hmm. that are like books about how that would leave a child with the impression that the police hate black people, mm -hmm. that the police constantly shoot black men. These, these are the most banned books I'm, I'm bringing up just in um, case any of this so, falls into that category. And so I do think it's true that some of these books that, again, have that sort of like gratuitous profanity, vulgarity, et cetera. So I would always say, like, have a conversation about it and, dis and, and you Maybe. see whether or not you think it's appropriate. Now, this book right here, this book is gay. That's a book. <laughs> again, it's got this like really friendly looking cover. It's, you know, the Pride Progress flag. If you dive into that book, the book contains explicit instructions on how minors can go on an app to meet adult men for sex. Hmm. Wait, okay. so, real? Yeah. So if you, so part of it is like these books and gender queer, which is also a really, again, in the name of inclusion, it's the memoir of this, of this person and it's a graphic novel and it has pornographic, you know, you see explicit oral sex going on in it and and, and it there's looks use of a strap just, on and there's talk of like mm -hmm. there's yes, a, yeah there's a strap on it, just yes, for, our, for our audio listeners gender queer and a book called flamer were the topped banned books for the first half of the 2022-2023 school year and so um, it's it's yeah. easy to say oh these people are against this book because it's an lgbt book that is not the reason that they're against the book the, they're mm -hmm. against the book because it is I mean, technically, I think pornography has to be photographed. So I guess maybe it's not porn pornographic because it's it's illustrations. It's a graphic novel. So it looks like cartoons. But really? it's very this is gender queer, right? Yeah, th this is gender queer, but it's very explicit. And what has happened is like, again, you have a bunch of these books written in recent years. They're, it's not like it's a book and there's characters who are LGBT characters, which I I really don't think that there'd be any uproar over that. It, instead, these are books that are sort of like the whole point of the book is about gender ideology, sexual orientation. Um, they're kind of like, it's kind of like the modern version of the coming of age book mm -hmm. where it's like, you know, my journey as a, as a, what, as a gay person or trans person or whatever. And the content is, in the opinion of many people and parents, including very sort of like Democrats for life and even progressives, that it, it that the content is not appropriate for a school library. Dude. I don't hear there are certainly some people I mean, who, who would say you know, this shouldn't be in my town library, and that's certainly yeah. isn't my position. But isn't there there's always been a discomfort among adults when we're talking about coming of age stories like you know teens engaging with sexuality in any way is yeah. always going to be controversial um i so isn't it really an age appropriate question like gender queer should not be in an elementary school i don't know exactly how i feel about it i i i have not read it so i don't know but maybe something like that could be appropriate in some high school library like what well, what, real what are your... in a lot of middle school libraries so we're talking about a book the... I've, I've unfortunately read it and middle school is obviously a very hard time in a child's life to sort of uh, figure out standards of appropriateness right like i think that there are lots of things where it's very easy for reasonable adults of sound mind to say a 16 year old has probably already been exposed to this idea um but it's a lot harder to make that ruling about an 11 year old or a yeah. 12 year old i mean at least for me having read gender queer which 
is like a few hours of my life that I'll never be able to get back. Just the fact that you have these like dildo strap-ons and like this this very explicit cartoonish use of sex toys, at least to me, it feels a little bit different than the coming of age novels that perhaps all of us read growing up, where it was a little bit more like, I don't know, person meets somebody, they have a big crush, they fall in love. Okay, now they're experimenting. I don't know. Like that type of thing feels, at least to me, much more developmentally appropriate, much more relatable for a lot of teenagers than the like somehow as, you know, preteens or teenagers, we have access to a bunch of sex toys. Like, uh -huh. yeah, like this definitely isn't Judy Bloom. So when I was growing up, it was like the controversy was sort of over Judy Bloom's book. Then again, maybe I won't. Yeah. Which, like that is just not even in the realm of what a lot of these books are now. There's a whole genre for women, especially for girls. That's like the losing the virginity genre of book and the like how much emotional heft is placed on that and whether you should do it with somebody you love and, and whether it will be scary and painful. And this is like, I think, in a different league. Yeah. So again, yeah. I, I think that people could have a kind of a robust or discussion argument about genderqueer in at the high school mm -hmm. level. Um, I I suspect I would probably think it's not really appropriate for a school library. But the truth is, I'm not even a hundred percent. But but instead, what's happened is like it's it it's painted as people are against this book because it has LGBT people in it yeah there's more to the story is what you're saying yeah and i but, just don't think that that's an accurate description of the red flags and why people uh -huh. are bothered by these books i but think then the, i see other story i see other books on the list like the bluest eye which is like a tony morrison book from the 70s about a young black girl who's trying to you know come to terms with her racial identity and place in america and um you know, that raises my eyebrow that anyone would not want that available to be checked out at a, at a school library. Again, I don't know the details if it, this was a case of moving from uh, one library to another library, but the fact that it's one of the more listed as one of the more frequent banned ones makes me think that someone doesn't like it being there, probably for, you know, these uh, anti critical race theory reasons. Where I get, uh, I guess, the, the the thing that is complicated about it to me is that these debates do seem to like the idea that they're going to happen in a state house or some, you know, uh, or, uh, or from a governor's office, like that the, the a governor or legislator is going to know how to arrange a school library. It seems to me a dubious proposition. And that's why I my my favorite solution to all of this is just more school choice where people can go to the woke school if they want to go to the woke school or they can go to the sort of austere classical academy if they want to or the science academy and I feel like yep. that would solve a lot of these problems um you know you've still got the kind of traditional public schools that i guess would still be battlegrounds for this but it doesn't seem to me that having the school library be subject to like state level congressional debates is really the healthiest way for us to move forward in, in this realm. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, at the end of the day, too, right, like communities sort of decide what what they want and how they want to be. And so when we see some of the craziest stuff that gets a huge reaction at the end of the day, like if that district in Vermont, this is what they want, you know, they either if they don't like it, they vote out the people that they have that they have there. So I do see this as being a more of a local. Yeah. I just think as soon as you get to like that state level, I don't know, it just feels like it's too unwieldy, I think. And communities mm -hmm. are really different. Um, so I agree with you on that. And of course, like, again, like I 100 percent agree with you, too. Like, there's just no such thing as a one size fits all thing in terms of schools. You see within families, even you could have three kids that just thrived at their local high school. And one of the kids just didn't work and it wasn't a fit. So. I never pretend that school choice is like this magic bullet that's going to solve all problems because there are no magic bullets really for anything. But I certainly think that one piece of the puzzle of dealing with this parental concern slash distress slash like, like p there's always been issues with parents and it's like, ah, I don't really feel like th this teacher aligns with my values, let's just say. 
But I think for some people, it's gotten to the point where they actually feel like the school is really actively working against their values and even trying to drive mm-hmm. a wedge between parent and child. And with a lot of the gender policies, I mean, you really can't deny that. Like, like when the policy states we're going to be putting your child on a plan and you don't have a right to know about it. So I, I think you're right about school choice thing. And the book thing, too, like the bluest eye. I mean, people have been upset about that book since I can remember when we had to read it in high school. So I also just think there's just there's people's threshold for what they think is OK in books is always going to vary, which is why which is why. Like, to your point, like it can't be oh this person's upset, this book has to go. I mean, I do think that, though, however, like let's get serious, right? Like we're not, Toni Morrison is not in the same category as a lot of these garbage books that have suddenly appeared on awards lists and in these libraries. It's kind of what Liz was saying before with, are we just following a sort of ephemeral trend and wasting time on things that are not going to have lasting value? I think I afford a little bit less charity to um, this sort of ideological wave because it doesn't feel like it came from nowhere. Right. Like the thing that I just keep thinking is like, you know how we're in the era of sort of like AI generated slop. Um, It's sort of the catch all term for just like garbage content that we're really not enriched by consuming. Mm -hmm. I feel like we're in that era of like trans theme book slop where it's just kind of like shoved down your throats or the throats of your children, regardless of whether there's any sort of literary merit to it. And I at least begin to get a little bit conspiratorial, truth be told, where I'm a little bit like, how did we get to this point? where I've had to waste precious hours of my life trying to understand what gender queer is. And I understand that many people think that it's a right wing talking point to be overly fixated, especially on this one specific book. But I at least feel angry at the idea that like my opposition to this stupid freaking book, which I've invested a lot of time in actually understanding <laughs> that this isn't somehow equated with Um, support of book bans. Like book banning is a horrible thing. Like book banning, book burning, all of these things are just, I cannot imagine politically or culturally wanting to stem the flow of information. Information wants to be free. And it's a very good thing for young minds to be exposed to all kinds of things. I mean, hell, I hope my child reads the the writings of Hitler and Stalin and other odious figures throughout history so that they can deeply understand these like absolutely toxic, uh, highly offensive murderous ideologies because you have to understand history and i think that's a part of a rich sort of like learning diet but it makes me angry that my opposition to gender queer or some of these other books is equated with wanting books to be banned is this even the right framing for this conversation at all erica no it's absolutely not because again you can't have every single book in the school library i don't hear anybody whining about the fact that donald trump's art of the deal isn't in the school (laughs) library right like you (laughs) So it's like that's wait till we get the Trump. Wait till we get the Trump charter schools going, then we'll that'll yeah. be like required reading first day. So uh, again, it's like it's like it's not that the book shouldn't exist. The book's welcome to exist, and they can write it, and they can publish it. And people can buy it. But like of all of the texts out there, like this ends up like not only in your library but on a display, you know, with all these as if it's like this like amazing thing, and you're thinking like this is just garbage, um, and. So, yes, this is definitely a fad. I, I, I do feel like that. Like, it feels like suddenly people would send us pictures from school libraries all over the country and like the displays would look identical. And it was all yeah. these like same sort of like new books that were all about gender and all this other stuff. The other thing that bothers me is that a lot of these books, like they don't even tell the truth. Right. So if you're going to make if you're going to have I Am Jazz, the Jazz Jennings book, which is a children's book, which we see all the time in elementary schools. Uh, well, maybe you want to tell the truth about how that has turned out. Right. Instead, it's this like it's as if this is a really happy story when like it's not a happy story and it's a very complex story. And it's and it's what what has happened. Just the 30 just like tons of complications, multiple surgeries, bad depression, you know, really like like become very, very obese. Like it's not this like it's not this children's book where you see this like smiling child. Um, And so I think that's the other thing is it's it's an epilogue. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, I think um, I feel I I think I feel angry about this because this the book banning the opposition to book banning has become a big New York City public library um basically PR campaign. So everywhere every time you go every time I go to the Queens Public Library in my borough or the Brooklyn Public Library you see the like we stand opposed to book banning almost like patriotic liberal coded like we believe in you know the first amendment we believe information wants to be free type thing. 
And I cannot help that every time I take my child to story time, feel a sense of like sneering at this, a sense of anger at our political system and culture wars getting us to this point where, you know, this is something that makes me feel that type of way, but also a sense of anger because it's like it feels like it for the fly on the wall, for the um, passerby who doesn't follow this as closely as I do. It feels like you could very easily have your mind warped into believing that actually liberal progressive institutions like the New York City Public Library stand on the side of freedom and justice and, um, you know, choosing not to suppress knowledge, but it's all those other bad people who want active knowledge suppression. And to me, like, that's just a totally distorted framing of this type of thing. And so I, I think I feel angry because it feels like my city is ground zero for this shit. And it's also like what you just said really does kind of illustrate what we're seeing in schools, too. Right. Yeah. So it's like the same people that are like, we're so against book bans. Really? Well, what Abigail Schreier writes a book and you can't, you know, suddenly you support that ban like you won't carry that book. Uh, we don't see Thomas Sowell really in like any school libraries at all. So it's it's again, it's like those books are the ones that they want to champion. But the same people do not want other texts. So it's all yeah. It's all ideology. It's all tribal. And you're right to be frustrated by it because it's incredibly frustrating, especially because for people who don't obviously have the time or take the time to dig into what's really going on with these debates, it's these quick little sound bites. And suddenly it's like, oh, that group. Oh, yeah. Aren't they a bunch of book banners? And you're like, what are you talking about? Um, so, yes, it is frustrating. And I can imagine it's even more frustrating at the at, at the public library in Queens. Um the but, Brooklyn one's yeah. even worse. At least in Queens, we have only one Greta Thunberg related book. In Brooklyn, it's all over the place. Well, so you're you're a parents group, and your objective here is partially to keep parents in the loop. And you you mentioned earlier that one of the biggest areas where they're being cut out is with this question of gender. Yeah, um, that is being pushed in some of these books, but also the way the schools handle gender transition has been a uh, increasingly salient and controversial issue as uh, tr as uh, tr youth transition numbers have, have gone up. Um, most of your lawsuits, I was looking through your website, ha I'd say the majority of them have something to do with gender or Title IX. You've got one against the Department of Education, trying to just get information from them having to do with gender issues. Uh, here you've got a graphic cited uh, called the Gender Triangle. Uh, you've cited that as a problematic, problematically used by Jefferson County, Colorado School District. Um, the group that pushed the, that put this together is called uh, GLSEN and they describe it this way. They say, upon birth, we're typically categorized into one of two genders, boy or girl, depending on how our genitals are read. Throughout our lives, however, many our many bodily characteristics work together to create a unique path of development. While this development often happens on its own during puberty, this change can also be administered through medicine, such as hormone replacement therapy. What is wrong with the approach, this approach to handling gender identification in schools? I mean, I'm not even really sure why schools are involved in this at all. Like, I don't I have a really hard time seeing why that information should make its way to children by way of their school. Um, and again, this is, again, one of those topics that has just exploded. We see like a lot of copy paste. If you look at the policies, the word it's like the wording is almost identical, sometimes from the State Department of Ed, sometimes from the School Board Association. But this is one of the most insidious. Like if there are, there's lots of hills you can consider dying on. I think this is my hill to die on. And it's partly because I was a teacher for a bunch of years and now I am a parent. The idea that a school district's policy would be to willingly and deliberately deceive parents is, um, I mean, it is just a total betrayal. I mean, in many ways, it's uh, what just do you mean by what do you mean by that? Uh, in what way are they deceiving parents? So, so 
as you guys probably know, you know, your child can't take a Tylenol or an Advil at school without you signing off on it. I'm pretty sure they won't even give them sunscreen without you signing off on it. But if a child decides that they are going to or want to identify as the opposite sex at school, then the school will put them on a gender support plan. And it will say, you know, that they're going to use different restrooms, different locker rooms on overnight field trips. They're going to be rooming with members of the opposite sex. Um, and it asks the child decides if the parents are going to be made aware of this plan. So right. it asks them, do your parents know? Are they aware? And the entire thing is driven by the child. So if the child says, no, they don't know, and I don't want them to know, then the policy is that the school must withhold that information. So it means that when the parent goes in for a parent-teacher conference, like it's all kind of a scam, right? Like the, 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 the teacher is going to refer to your child in front of you by their legal name, but at school, they go by something else. And that mm -hmm. information is is but the policy states that the parents are not allowed to be informed. Right. And there's been various states have banned this practice. Florida, again, being one of them with a parental bill of rights saying the schools have to inform the parents if they are going to be socially transitioning their child. California just did the opposite yep. where there were school districts that adopted a version of the Florida law in their district. And then California overrode that and said, nope, uh, you cannot pass a law like that. And the um, the privacy of the student to socially transition because they might have a parent who's hostile to their trans identity. It's their right to keep that information private. And from your perspective, that is just categorically the the wrong thing to do. Yeah, I mean, schools serve in local parentis, so the only reason that they have authority over children is that the parents hand that authority over to them. So I think legally, really, schools are going to have a, are, are in big trouble with this also. The other thing is there you cannot maintain education records and then not share them with parents. So like FERPA, that federal law, you have to share all education records with parents. And yet we see schools are maintaining like separate sets of records, so they'll have this is the name that's going to be on the report card that gets sent home, but this is the name that's going to be in our system for everything that happens in-house. So I think legally, it's a problem that's eventually going to have to be resolved, you know, by a high court. But I also think that just ethically and morally, this is is just, it's so wrong. I mean, you hear all the time, right? Kids can't be successful without parent engagement. The schools beg for parent engagement, you know. They criticize parents for being checked out, for not being engaged, for not participating. And then it's like this slap in the face that basically says, like, we aren't going, we don't, we're not going to tell you about this major thing going on in your child's life. The other thing that's kind of crazy about it is it's like these same people hiding this information are the ones who claim all the time that these kids are at greater risk of suicide. Now, putting but aside whether or not that's true, and I, don't necessarily think it is but if they think that it's like you're withholding information from parents and in the next breath you're basically saying you think that their child is at greater risk of suicide and you're willing to keep that from them i mean that's just yeah. like insidious um yeah so yeah I, this is a big and this just to give you know listeners and viewers a sense like we're only a 13 person you know organization so this is not an exhaustive list, but we've been able to document the policies um, where we call that a parental exclusion policy, where parents are not allowed to know that staff is told that they need to withhold information from parents. 1,116 school districts, 20,473 schools, and number of students affected 11,967,933. So this is a nice. this is very pervasive. With the exception of the Sun Belt, um, we see this everywhere. Now in in Idaho, it's not in nearly as many districts as it is in California and New York. So certainly still, you know, the Oregon, Washington, California, New York, but in all the red states, these policies absolutely are in place. And I was guilty of not realizing what my own district policy said. Like, I just did not realize that this was in it. And so the thing I would say to people, too, is like most parents right. have no idea that the policy is to withhold this information from them. 
Yeah. I mean, a lot of what we've been discussing today is, I think, up for debate and especially these questions of, you know, who should be making what kind of decisions about what books go in schools or curriculum decisions at what level should that be set? But this very fundamental question of should parents be kept in the loop, that is not controversial to me. Like this is an egregious overreach yes. to assume that uh, the the state, the gover a government funded school has a right to more information about uh, your child and the upbringing of your child than you do. So, you know, on on that issue in particular, I'm 100 percent on the side of all these parents rights groups. Um, we I we could go for much longer because there's a, a lot more uh, that's yep. very interesting about what your group is doing. I uh, encourage people to look uh, into the work that you're doing on um, discipline in schools, which is a big issue. But uh, we are running out of time. So I want to ask you the final question of the show, which is what is a question that you think more people should be asking? Uh, I think that more people should be asking why are boys trailing their sisters on every single education related metric Brilliant. and also why are so few people, um, you know, speaking out about that, particularly again on the left, on the Democrat side, I would say, um, and why are we not how do we have seven offices dedicated to women's health and zero mm. federal offices and zero dedicated to boys and men? So I know that it, we've seen some improvement on this for sure. There's, but there's a really long way to go. And, you know, you can tell me the future is female. You can tell me, you know, that I need to smash the patriarchy and all of that. But um, there's a real problem here going on with boys. Um, and it, 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 and it crosses pretty much every demographic like we see it across the demographic groups um so that's what people should be asking about and you know kind of joining together to take on great um and i will go ahead and recommend even though i know you have your differences with her our episode with ruth whitman where we talk about raising boys um we'll link that in the episode below um erica sanzi uh it, what where should people go if they're interested in what they've heard today to see more of your work sure so our website is defendinged.org um we've got tons of resources there uh lots to look through and then um we're also on social media we have a facebook page parents defending education our our twitter or x handle is at defending ed um so yeah we're easy to find and on okay, twitter if anybody just wants to follow me um i'm at esanzi there you go. Erica Sanzi, thanks for talking with us today. Thanks so much for having me, guys. It's great. Thanks for listening to Just Asking Questions. These conversations appear on Reason's YouTube channel and the Just Asking Questions podcast feed every Thursday. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and please rate and review the show.